The B and LC, or Beaumont and Lake Charles Railroad, is a fictional railroad that runs between Horseleaf, Louisiana, Svelteville, Louisiana, and Corpus Christi, Texas. Reminder that these are fictional towns aside from Corpus Christi. Please do not search them up on Google because you're not going to get anything. This railroad is shared by 18 railroads today, 8 of which actually exist in real life and 10 of which are entirely fictional. These railroads are Santa Fe, Burlington Northern, Southern Pacific, Union Pacific, Missouri Pacific, EMD Leasing, and Missouri Kansas, Texas. In this documentary, we will explore the railway in its heyday during the 1960s. We will see high speed steam excursions, famous passenger trains, small commuter trains, and both heavy and light freight trains. This railroad is not only the largest to only serve the Louisiana and Texas area, but it is also the line to serve the most railroads on a single main line with dozens of other branches, at least in the present. In the past, only five railroads ran this line. We will start with the most infamous passenger trains and work our way down to the local freights of this rail line. Let's have a look at the Beaumont and Lake Charles Horse Thief Subdivision, the Age of the Iron Horses. Perhaps I should say those five railroads running this line. These railroads are obviously starting with the Beaumont and Lake Charles, or BNLC as you may know, St. Louis Western as the railroad's newest colleague, Sorcor or the Rockford route, Missouri Kansas Texas or MKT, and HIRM or Hustler Industrial Railway of Middleton. Today is May 12th, 1966. A very important day for this rail line. Today was the day when EMD's new section of general purpose series locomotives will be trialed on certain parts of this subdivision, but we'll get into that later. The B&LC was actually the only railroad to have both diesels and steam engines work alongside each other instead of having the steam locomotives immediately being scrapped by the early 1950s like most railroads did. Now we are at BNLC's famous Bertram train station. We will be riding one of BNLC's most famous long distance routes, which is called the Bayou Bell, and it runs overnight from Phoenix to Atlanta, running through six states in a time of roughly 20 hours with a distance of nearly 1,800 miles. This train will be led by one of the many 2200 class 2A2 Mikado steam locomotives owned by the BNLC since 1919. Our train should arrive within the next 8 minutes.
This train consists of four baggage cars with two on each end, a parlor car, two dining cars, four sleeping cars, six coaches, and a lounge car in the middle, making a total of 18 cars for this journey. Our train should depart within the next 12 minutes. Just after leaving Bertram, behind us is the former Bertram layover yard, which had to be dismantled in very early 1951 due to a severe flood that damaged it beyond repair. The yard was used way before the BNLC became a thing, and it dates all the way back to the Phoenix, Austin, and Mobile Railway back in the 1840s. The Bayou Belle has been a household name since the early 1930s when the train first ran. It's been serving on a bi-weekly basis, which basically means that they've been running twice a week. We will follow this train on a 25 minute journey between here in Bertram and Svelteville Station, with a distance of roughly 30 miles, seeing various scenes of pure southern scenery. Shortly after departing the Great Ridge City, we're met with a track Y, which is basically two tracks that form a Y shape when either two lines are meeting or if a train has to turn around the other way. There are a plentiful amount of these track layouts among this route, so be on the lookout! Just outside of Bertram, we cross into the small metropolitan suburb of Bertram known as Argyle, which has a population of roughly 38,000 residents. It also has a popular photography spot known as Lake Argyle, which is a small body of water stretching from Feldenek, Louisiana to Little Rock, Arkansas.
Also up ahead is this tiny unincorporated village called Middleton, Louisiana, which has its own tiny industrial railway that we will visit sometime later in the film. Track speeds will remain relatively high for this type of train, as the limit is 75 miles per hour for passenger trains. Let's, en let's enjoy this 30 mile trip to Svelterville, Louisiana. One of our only two stops on this journey is Horse Thief, Louisiana, one of the most famous rail fan locations on the B and L C. Its historic train station dates back to 1858, around the time when the capital of Colorado, called Denver, was founded. This station is almost directly next to the B and L C's gigantic horse thief yard, and it currently holds the record for Louisiana's fifth largest rail yard, with the largest being Liviona Yard located in Baton Rouge, which is now operated by Union Pacific. Since Horse Thief Station is very tiny, the Bayou Belle had to improvise by only letting passengers out through the first three or four coaches. 
the BNLC still has yet to fully renovate the station after it being last renovated in 1907. As a result, some of the train has to block one of the two grade crossings in the vicinity of the station and the yard, which can be a minor inconvenience at times. Boarding times at this station usually take 30 to 40 minutes to board prior to departure. We should be back on the move soon. Departing Horse Thief, we pass Horse Thief Yard, which is already looking pretty active. We can already see a good amount of trains and cars either stored or getting ready to head out for the day. Here's another track Y, and this one's pretty interesting. This Y has a few extra switches because its two tracks can divert onto either the same direction or opposite direction. We're taking the right direction as it is our way up to Svelterville via the Bayou State's tallest grade called the Jerry Baldy Grade.
This is Garibaldi Highland Station, which is the most scenic stop on the Horse Thief. The Bayou Bell doesn't stop here, however, but there are other services that stop here, typically shorter distance. The Bayou Bell usually passes the station between 45 and 55 miles per hour. A long train like this passing a tiny station like this is truly a sight to behold. Where we're standing is the site of a former coal mine, nicknamed the Sunburst because of how unbearable the heat would be during the summer months when the workers were underground getting coal. It's been torn down in 1879 and has been regrowing and became a very large lake. We're passing Jerry Baldy Yard, which is our final checkpoint on this journey before we reach our destination. Jerry Baldy Yard hosts about 90 to 100 freight trains a day, making it the second most active yard on the subdivision. This yard, unlike anything else, sees commuter service pretty often. In fact, there is a very tiny platform where trains terminate, and since the yard is easily accessible, it's very easy to turn the train around. Jerry Baldy's passenger stop sees about 20 trains a day.
Here we are at our final destination, the snowy village of Svelterville. The reason why the entire town is covered in snow is still undiscovered and has been for the past few centuries and has been the biggest mystery ever since. Besides the mystery, Svelterville is a very welcoming and cozy village with a lot of stuff to do and not a huge population. It houses roughly 8,000 residents and is known for its gorgeous scenery with the mountains and snow. It makes a great place for rail fans because of the incredibly scenic areas. Our train is currently disembarking passengers and the railway crew still has yet to install pedestrian crossings so that civilians don't trip on the tracks while disembarking or boarding the train. The Bayou Bell makes a quick stop here for about 20 minutes and quickly gets back on its way towards Atlanta. Let's check out our next train journey, shall we? We're back at Jerry Baldi's tiny commuter station to ride one of the BNLC's most unique services. We will be riding BNLC's train 46 West, known as the Lone Star Express. The Lone Star Express is a service that runs from Jerry Baldi, Louisiana to Alexandria, Louisiana. The Lone Star Express is normally pulled by one or two of Baldwin's RF-16s that were primarily built for freight use but were sometimes used for passenger trains. These locomotives were nicknamed the Shark Nose because of the locomotive's obscure nose design. Jerry Baldi's tiny commuter station was built in 1859 and was last renovated in 1920 and it has a small parking lot along with a small and cozy station house that serves as a waiting area along with a singular track for commuter trains that terminate here. Since this train has locomotives on both ends, it takes less time to turn the train around, therefore departing quicker. Boarding times at Jerry Baldi usually take between 15 and 25 minutes because the Lone Star still gets a lot of ridership, but not as much as the Bayou Bell. And plus, it's a shorter train with only six Pullman coach cars.
This train struggled immensely to get moving due to there being a lot of stuff in the tracks from the day before, but after four unsuccessful attempts to get it going, the engineers eventually got it moving on its feet. It had to depart nearly 10 minutes late. Jerry Bowley Yard, shockingly enough, was completely empty today. Right after our train departs the yard, it immediately puts the foot to the floor to make up for the lost time. The top speed for these locomotives were originally 65 miles per hour, but due to them being modified by the BNLC in 1954, they were geared for slightly faster speeds and now have a maximum speed of 72 miles per hour. These RF-16s were only seen on this specific train, which explains their obscurity on the BNLC system, and they were the only modified RF-16s to see commuter service. The BNLC themselves bought 75 RF-16s for mixed freight, and only two of them including their B units were, were modified. However, the B unit for locomotive number 701 was currently being serviced at the BNLC Baton Rouge shops. We'll be riding the Lone Star Express back to Bertram as it is our next stop. Let's enjoy 25 miles of scenery that you probably haven't seen yet. <laughs> While going down Jerry Baldy grade, we have a meet with one of Electromotive Division's, or EMD's, newest special duty series locomotives, called the SD45. The SD45's here are currently being tested on a loaded TOFC train from Beaumont, Texas to Jackson, Mississippi via the Horse Thief subdivision. The SD45 started production in 1966 and the BNLC was one of the first railroads to buy them. The TOFC's on the BNLC are commonly known as the right as the Road Express trains due to them being on truck trailers carried on flat cars which are then taken to a set destination by rail. These SD45s were meant to replace high priority freight trains that were formerly led by GP7 locomotives. The GP7s are still in service but just aren't on high priority intermodal trains and stuff like that. The GP7s instead got moved to low priority local freights and occasional passenger trains.
This bridge is called the Laquette Historic Trestle because it has been Louisiana's tallest railway trestle for over a century. It was built in 1839 and it crosses directly over Horse Thief's Yard and Station and is currently one of the BNLC's most scenic spots. What we're passing now is the tiny industrial branch called the Tahogi Branch where locals normally deliver their goods. It was built in the 1910s as a small extension and has been very well kept ever since. This is Summit Yard, the second tiniest yard on the subdivision. Summit Yard currently serves as a commuter rail yard, but is currently empty due to there being commuter trains active all over the subdivision. The yard was built in the 1840s and, and was formerly used by the PA and M, or the Phoenix and Austin and Mobile Railway.
Just after descending from Kyle Hill, the train slams its brakes due to the train crews not noticing the speed limit sign. The train quickly breaks to 40 miles per hour as it passes Louisiana's oldest depot, which conveniently enough is our final checkpoint before our destination. This is Bertram Depot. This depot is currently the state's oldest running depot, which was built in 1839. Bertram Depot is actually a commuter station, strangely enough. It started serving passengers in 1872 and is still serving to this day. As of the time this documentary was filmed, it was serving for nearly a century. It's small, but it gets heavy numbers on the board in terms of ridership and money. The depot would be renamed to Bertram North and 40th Avenue in 1980. Train 46 successfully arrives into Bertram, making up only 5 minutes of lost time, still making it 5 minutes late. Fortunately, it departed Bertram right on time, thus concluding our passenger rail journey. Let's move on to some of the freight operations seen on the B&LC. Now we are revisiting Middleton. Middleton is a small village east of Horse Thief. 
Middleton has a tiny railway that operates to power the town and keep it up and running. Since Middleton is a very poor village and was severely impacted by the flood that happened in 1951 that was mentioned earlier. This railway is called the Hustler Industrial Railway of Middleton. Established in 1955, this is a relatively new railway, as of the time this was filmed. The railway uses four very unique locomotives. The locals of the village like to call the locomotives Hustlers, given their railway name. They're all heavily modified GE 25 ton switcher locomotives, first built for the Erie in 1941. When the Erie retired some of their 25 tonners in, in 1954, they were shipped over to the Horse Thief Sub to work as an industrial rail provider for Middleton. They were modified to haul longer loads and objectively last longer, which which explains them being larger than the traditional 25 tonner. The railroad began operation in Middleton in the beginning of 1955 and has been providing the small town with goods like oil, coal, logs, steel, and anything else you can possibly think of. As you may be able to notice, the tracks are not really maintained very well due to the said tracks being heavily damaged by the flood. Today, a mainline train is delivering some more products for this small industrial town railway. Locomotives number 56, 57, 52, and 53 are all lined up on a switch directly outside the main line to start helping with the switching. All of the cars here are being taken from the main line train, which means it'll be a much more tedious job. Today, there has been specific order placed for stone plates, coal, steel, rock, and miscellaneous items from boxcars. 56 and 57 will have their own set of cars, while 52 and 53 will be running as a pair. For the beginning operation, locomotive number 56 takes the two trailing steel beam flat cars across the industries to place them into storage with the help of its sister locomotive number 57, because if only one locomotive does the switching, it has nowhere else to run around the train since there is only one siding, so two locomotives are sometimes needed for operations like these, and they are especially common on this railroad. Once number 56 takes the cars to their correct siding, number 57 takes the cars and shoves them into the siding, making the first part of their operation complete.
While 57 runs back to the siding with 56 following short after, the paired locomotives number 52 and 53 conduct a street running operation delivering miscellaneous items that are currently loaded in the boxcars to their correct industries. <laughs> Locomotive 56 appears again to collect the coal cars from the mainline train that's kind enough to help out by pushing the coal cars already into the siding for 56 to collect. Fifty-six then takes the loaded cars from the main line to the siding that leads to a small coal mine for 57 to shove into. While locomotive number 56 cobbles up to some stone plate flat cars, the mainline train decides to help with the switching by shoving the rest of its train into all of their designated sidings, which then have their designated industries. 
The truck trailers along with the singular LCL boxcar, or less than truckload boxcar, would go into the spur track that acts as a port. When 52 and 53 finished their boxcar sorting, they'd run light back to the main siding to help switch the rest of the mainline train's goods. Pretty much everyone is at work here. Here we could see the mainline train shoving 12 loaded coal cars into a grain elevator because the coal mine with the other set of loaded cars were currently being unloaded. This was a very tricky operation due to the tracks not being in good shape. The mainline train locomotives, SD45-2 number 5600 and rare Alco C636 High Hood number 690, drop off some two bay composite hopper cars and the last three miscellaneous boxcars for 52 and 53 to take to, to their respective industries. All the mainline pair pushes their last set of cold cars into the grain elevator.
For the final operation, Locomotive number 57 takes the set of stone plate fat cars and takes them to the stone industry where the tracks are the worst in the entire facility. Here we see 52 and 53 shoving the two big composite grain hoppers into another grain elevator where it'll be unloaded in onto smaller trucks which then deliver them to their respective stores and markets. In the background we can see 5600 and 690 shoving the last set of coal cars into the other grain elevator in the back. After that's done, the locomotives take the last three boxcars and takes them to their respective customer sightings along with all the other boxcars that they help shove, thus ending their operations for the day. Locomotive 57 takes the stone plates to the stone industry siding while 56 shoves them in, while tracks at this part of the railroad are the worst in the system, which explains why this is one of the toughest jobs to complete on the railway. Thank you. 
When they finish this job, 5600 and 690 run light back to Horse Thief Yard with just their caboose. They will come back at the end of the day with all of the cars at Middleton ready to be further shipped. Let's move on to one of the rarest occurrences on the BNLC, shall we? We're back yet again at Jerry Baldi Yard to witness possibly the rarest thing that has ever happened on the BNLC's Horse Thief sub. A St. Louis Western Intermortal train is starting up and getting ready to depart until two of EMD's newest GP35s break down almost immediately after starting up. Since this is a first time issue, the SLWR has no choice but to contact the BNLC for help. The SLWR asked for a specific diesel locomotive or two to rescue the train and take it to Corpus Christi, but the BNLC had something else in mind. This train was a high speed, high priority intermodal train going from Jerry Baldi Yard to Corpus Christi which by the time was just starting to get popular. The BNLC grabbed one of Baldwin's rare 2104 H1G locomotives built by Baldwin in the early 1950s. This specific Baldwin, number 9317, was sent to pull the entire train for its entire length considering it was high priority mail. 9317 was first built in 1951 and started serving on the BNLC in early 1953 and would serve until its late retirement in 2005 after serving for over 50 years on the BNLC. 9317 was one of the only 11 2104 H1Gs on the BNLC's roster. They were numbered between 9310 and 9320 and were sent to work on mainly heavy coal drags that were usually from the coal plant in Lake Charles called RS Nelson to the iron mills located in Ironton. 9317, however, was different. 9317 just finished going through an overhaul. Since all of the H1Gs were out doing runs on different parts of the system, 9317 was tasked to do this rescue run because the CEO quite literally said, why not? The 9317, along with its sister locomotives, are two 104 locomotives which are classed as Texas types because most of them were used by the Texas and Pacific Railway. But the BNLC immediately bought some after the Texas and Pacific. The H1Gs have the capability of reaching a maximum speed of 80 miles per hour whilst carrying at least 35 loaded coal cars. 
These H1Gs were incredibly strong as they had the tractive effort of up to 93,000 pounds or about 42,000 kilograms. With the train ready to go, it has to undergo a very unnecessary operation just to get going. Since there's no crossover switch on the on this side of the yard, this train has to reverse all the way back until the leading locomotive is past the switch on the other side of the yard. This is primarily the reason why most of the southbound Garibaldi trains are late by at least 5 minutes. It's extremely tedious for the train engineers, but it's the norm.
Now arriving at Corpus Christi, we can see another case of horrendous track maintenance. Since Corpus Christi is right by the ocean, you can imagine that Corpus Christi had it incredibly bad for them in 1951 when the flood hit. So much so that almost every single piece of rail infrastructure was heavily damaged or damaged beyond repair, which explains why the town currently looks like the Cleveland Flats. Due to the track conditions, all trains that either terminate or pass through the area can't go faster than 10 miles per hour. Some trains are so cautious about getting stuck that they only stay at 5 miles per hour or under. What we're passing now is what used to be three large passenger train platforms, as up until 1954, Corpus Christi was a big train station that only four long distance routes served as a way to provide passengers service to a small town by the ocean. It was demolished in 1954 due to the flood crippling its ridership numbers and causing excessive damage to the station building. Now it's a loading platform primarily for boxcars for when a freight train takes boxcars across the subdivision. You can clearly see the remnants of the old yard just outside the old station as two BNLC boxcars are stuck between the ground and the rails due to them being slipped off the rails from the flood. These track conditions are so bad that number 9317 is having to use more throttle than needed just to get over the tracks without getting stuck while also carrying over 50 loaded intermodal stack cars while carrying three broken down GP35 locomotives. All it needs to do is get the whole train past the yard switch so it can start shoving in its cars.
9317 accidentally winds up overshooting the switch by several hundred feet and now has to go through the tedious process of backing up while it needs to start shoving its 50 loaded intermodal cars into the former station yard where it'll conclude its trip.
When this process is finished, 9317 has to take the GP35s back to Horse Thief Sub since by this point they've entered the Corpus Christi Sub. In other words, all four locomotives are running light. This is the first time this has ever happened on this point of the railroad, so you can understand that rail fans were extremely eager to photograph this train in both directions. Also, this is the first time when the Corpus Christi wide track was used in over 15 years. The train barely has enough room to switch the track as you can see. Like I said, due to the worsening track conditions, the train cannot exceed 10 miles per hour while exiting the Corpus Christi area due to the risk of getting stuck. Ninety-three seventeen carefully tows the GP35s back to the Jerry Baldi yard, where a work train will escort them to the nearest locomotive maintenance facility to seek repairs. Let's move on to probably the most unique freight operation on the BNLC's Lockhead side of the Horse Thief subdivision. Now we're at Summit Yard. Summit Yard is the second tiniest rail yard on the subdivision. Summit Yard currently serves as a passenger train yard but occasionally sees freight trains. The yard is currently almost empty due to there being commuter trains active all across the subdivision, with all but one train currently operating. The yard was built in the 1840s and was formerly served by the PA&M or the Phoenix, Austin and Mobile Railroad. The train we'll be following now is one of the most unique jobs given to anyone on the railway. The engineers are tasked with running two completely different locomotives back to back with between 5 and 10 cars in between. These cars are most likely just empty coal cars to be taken to the Tahaki coal mine by the small Tahaki branch that cuts off the main line at Lockett. The train is often nicknamed the Lockett Shuffler by rail fans due to its unique operation. The locomotives normally seen on this train consist normally of a Missouri Kansas Texas diesel and a 600 class 080 switcher built by the BNLC in 1911. Today's train consists of Missouri Kansas Texas GP7 number 100 and BNLC 080 number 632 carrying three composite two bay grain hoppers along with seven empty coal cars.
The GP7 will run the train for its first part of the job, which is to deliver the three empty grain hoppers to the nearby grain industry called the Pasco that sits just outside the main line that passes through the town of Kyle, which means they'll have to leave the yard in reverse. This is pretty risky, however, due to it basically running on the wrong side of the track. Trains usually have to run on the right on the right hand side of the main line, but this specific operation makes the trains have to left hand run for only a short distance. While trying to drop the grain cars off, the train made a mistake. The GP7 has to first decouple and go to the adjacent siding so number, so number 632 can shove in the grain cars properly. When that's finished, the GP7 has to couple back to the rear of the train once it pulls past the switch. The train now has to run back to its starting point in order to go to the right side of the main line since their closest crossover switch is at the western side of Summit Yard. They have to do this to reduce the risk of left hand running for the entire journey.
once they set themselves to the right track, 100 leads the way all the way up to Luckett where it'll switch onto the Tahaki branch, but unfortunately the train received a red signal just before they could proceed.
Now that the train has arrived at the switch, the train has to switch directions due to there being no sightings on this very tiny branch. Since 100 led the way before, 632 has to basically do the rest of the work here by pulling the train into the coal mine and going around the mine's looping track in order to change direction while loading the coal cars. The Sahaki branch was built in 1915 as a small extension and has been well kept ever since. It was formerly an industrial and goods branch until 1939 when World War II broke out and all the industries had to be shut down. During the war in 1941, a coal mine was built to help power the town of Laquette and to help provide a coal supply for steam locomotives. It's called the Sahaki branch because of the mid-sized borough in the city of Laquette, called Sahaki.
With these specific cars, coal is unloaded through hatches at the bottom of the cars called rotary dumps. Unloading usually takes 10 to 15 seconds on average per car. So with a 7 car train, this can take roughly 1 to 2 minutes to fully unload. But it's fully dependent on how fast locomotives are allowed to travel, which is unfortunately not faster than 10 miles per hour due to the size of the coal cars. You're probably wondering, well, how does coal produce electricity? Well, to put it simple, coal plants produce electricity by burning coal into a boiler to produce steam. The steam produced under tremendous pressure flows into a turbine, which spins a generator to create electricity.
With that operation complete, 632 and 100 take the empty to Jerry Baldy Yard for the next train to take and then they head back home to Summit Yard with their operations done for today. With that said, let's take a look at our final operation to end off the day. We're at Horse Thief Yard with a very special train. This is Sork Horse Texan Comet, a long distance train that goes from Horse Thief, Louisiana to Fort Worth, Texas. You're probably wondering why it's pulling a B&LC coaches. Well, to answer that, this is the Sorco Railway's last run of the famous train. The Texan Comet's original set of two EMD E5s were unfortunately retired a day before the last run, so they decided to let two of Sorco's GP7s do the final run instead. The B&LC coaches are mainly there due to the Texan Comet being bought out by B&LC in 1965. After this last run, the Sorcor concludes passenger operations before entirely switching to freight operations, and after that, the BNLC would take over the train until discontinuation in 1989. This is quite literally Sorcor's last passenger train. Pulling a train are GP7s numbered 612 and 600, built by EMD in 1955. They were bought by the Sorcor in 1959 and were sent to work with mixed freight and commuter operations. This is the biggest assignment any of Sorcor's GP7s will ever do. The Texan Comet consists of four coaches, a dining car, and two sleeper cars. The train will start out at Horse Thief Yard and start boarding at Horse Thief Station. Since this is the Texan Comet's final run, it'll take much, much longer to completely board every passenger. The Texan Comet first debuted in 1947, advertised as the South's first post-war streamliner, and it used a pair of streamlined 462 Pacific steam locomotives built by Baldwin in 1939, however it was dieselized in 1957, and a pair of EMD E5s would run the train, well, until now, as they were retired a day earlier, unfortunately. We will follow this train to its next destination, located at Jerry Baldy Highland Station. 
Let's watch the Texan Comet leave Horse Thief Station for the last time. Sorcor's GP7 were built extremely differently from its other locomotives, primarily due to its performance. Most GP7s ever built from EMD had a maximum reachable speed of 65 miles per hour or 105 kilometers an hour. But Sorcor in particular relied on speed for basically everything, so what they did is they modified all of their GP7s to have a very high top speed of 95 miles per hour or 153 kilometers an hour but they were never allowed to exceed 75 miles per hour on most of their operations. However, the FRA gave Sorcor the grand privilege of letting the GP7s run full speed for the very first time, which means we'll be seeing a lot of 90 mile per hour action from these little Jeeps. It makes their last passenger train tons more special.
This is the last time that a Sorgor passenger train will ever cross over the historic Lockhead Trestle. Here, the Texan Comet is going over its last and final grade. With that, the Texan Comet slowly glides into Jerry Baldi Highlands for the final time. It stops here for quite a bit to let the passengers off the train and to let some air off after doing 95 miles per hour for at least 10 miles of the journey. The Texan Comet is being discontinued because of Sorcor's decision to completely become a freight railroad. They have agreed to hand over the Texan Comet operations to the BNLC so they continue running. The Texan Comet was the first train to be discontinued. 
All passenger trains would be discontinued by early 1970, with the only two, with only two being handed down to the BNLC, which are the Texan Comet and the Red River Rambler from Baton Rouge to Beaumont. This is quite emotional for the diehard Sorcore rail fans out there, and it's completely understandable. Sorcore had been running passenger trains since the 1920s when they started business on the railway. Their first passenger train left Remington, Nevada, and arrived at Horse Thief in 1922, and their final one ran in 1966. Over 40 years of passenger operations had come to a close on the Sorcore and we are witnessing the last page of its passenger rail history. Let's watch the train slowly exit Jerry Baldi for the last time with, con with the conductor putting on quite the show while departing. Here we can see the Texan Comet crossing over the last body of water it'll ever cross in Louisiana before arriving at its destination in Fort Worth, Texas. This has been an amazing journey following this train, and it's a shame that Sorcor won't ever see a passenger train again. They really made a count with this one. And that, my friends, is the wonderful subdivision of the B and LC, the Horse Thief Sub, the Age of the Iron Horses. We've explored the entire subdivision front and back, encountering all five operators in the span of a day. Thank you all again so much for sticking with us. 
It took me literally two months to put this together, so I highly would appreciate it if you guys would like and subscribe to the channel. Also, an extremely special thanks to Sneaky Steve God and his development team, as they're the ones who made this entire game happen. Thank you again for sticking around with me. In the future, there will definitely be more of these to come. Thank you all watching, and see you soon.